Hi there, my name is Erica Hagenson, and I'm the Assistant Director for Policy at the ARC of North Carolina. And we're here today to talk about one of our nation's most successful programs, an important safety net that touches nearly every family in the United States. We're here to talk about Social Security. Social Security is a promise that if you pay in, you will be protected. If you pay in, your family will be protected. And we, the intellectual and developmental disability community, are part of that promise. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about the grant that we received that helps us bring this material to you. What we mean by Social Security. The diverse relationship that even one community, the intellectual and developmental disability community, has with this insurance product and some of the key components that make it such a critical lifeline for our community. Finally, we're going to talk about some ways in which this successful, critically important program may be at risk for benefit reductions and what we can do about it. It's a lot of material um, and we look forward to sharing it with you. We're able to have this conversation with you today because we received a grant from the National Academy of Social Insurance, or NASI. And NASI is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C., made up of Social Security experts. And NASI was particularly interested in this growing national dialogue that we hear about the future of Social Security and wanted to make sure that vulnerable populations had a meaningful way to communicate their position and their relationship with this product in that growing dialogue. Well, what do we mean by what do we mean by a vulnerable population? We mean that individuals that might be disproportionately reliant upon social security and yet have a diminished voice. Two disability groups received funding through the National Academy of Social Insurance. The first was the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities or CCD. And CCD is a consortium made up of approximately 120 national, national groups that represent the sort of pan-disability, broad disability perspective. Anyone from the ARC and United Cerebral Palsy to the Epilepsy Foundation, Paralyzed Veterans for America, healthcare providers, um, service providers, a broad perspective of disability. And we are so pleased that they received a grant. They've put together some extraordinary material that we're going to direct you to later in the presentation. But in addition to the unified voice of a broad pan-disability perspective, we thought it was very, very important that individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IDD, also had a platform to talk about some of their unique perspectives on their relationship with Social Security. So we said we wanted to really reach out to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their families, and a subset of beneficiaries called Disabled Adult Children, or DAC beneficiaries. And DAC beneficiaries are individuals who acquired their disability before the age of 22, so any time between birth and 22. This is a severe disability and a persistent disability. It's going to go on long into the future they receive a percentage of their parents' benefit. And I'll go into greater detail about DAC beneficiaries, but this is the specific group that we wanted to, to target. Now, we didn't create this material alone. We partnered with 12 organizations in North Carolina who work on IDD issues, whether as in an academic environment, a research environment, a self-advocacy environment, a provider environment. And these 12 partners have really assisted us in honing our material and making it, we hope, particularly accessible and useful to you. Now, in addition to saying we wanted to reach out to these particular constituencies, that wasn't really enough. We had some broader goals when we applied for this grant. We really want to increase financial literacy for our community. We want people to understand what benefit they're receiving and why. 
and to be able to answer some of those questions so that they have a stronger understanding of their own safety net. We really wanted to showcase accessible formats. We, we know that accessible formats are good for everyone. And so we tried to include closed captioning on our video products. We tried to um, look at a more accessible way of providing a presentation. And we chose something called Prezi, which you're seeing now. Prezi tends to be picture heavy with text accents rather than text heavy with picture accents. We find that for a broad population, it tends to be a little more inviting. Um, we also know that for folks who are not reliant upon reading to garner their information, it's a more accessible way of having that dialogue. We really wanted to remember our strengths. The disability movement is a kitchen table movement. We were started by parents and later siblings and self-advocates who at the end of a hard day on evenings and weekends sat around a kitchen table and said, I don't know where we're going and I don't know how to get there, but I know we can't stay here. And that passion launched a movement and that movement has created such change, such opportunity and so many rights for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it's important to remember that although we have technical experts at every level of government working on these issues, the, our most powerful tool in affecting change is still our kitchen table. It's still telling our story. It's still educating lawmakers. It's still building relationships and being a part of our community. And finally, we wanted to be part of the national dialogue this growing dialogue of social security in a meaningful way. And we had sort of three goals that, that illustrated that meaningful participation. First is that we wanted lawmakers, when they talked about the importance of social security, to broaden their discussion beyond simply retirees and include DAC beneficiaries. And we didn't just want them to talk about the importance of disabled adult children or DAC beneficiaries, when they're talking to the disability community, we wanted them to mention our role and our piece of that promise to a broader community. We wanted to create materials that would encourage organizations that might previously have thought Social Security too complicated, a policy topic to take on, to make it accessible and one that they felt that they could follow and engage in and participate in a policy level. And I think most importantly, we wanted to empower individuals with disabilities to use their voice and to use their voice effectively on their own behalf to affect the change that they need to see in their life. Now we're going to see one such individual, um, a self-advocate named Kira, who's going to tell her story about what Social Security means to her. Hi, my name is Kira. I'm 34 years old and I live in North Carolina. As you can see, I use a power wheelchair because I happen to live with cerebral palsy. I love my life for the most part. I need SSDI in order to have a livelihood just like every other human being on this earth. The income that I receive from my job is only $400 a month, and that does not even cover half of my expenses. What happens at the end of the month if I don't have a lot of extra money and I still need food? I have to pinch my pennies. I usually end up buying oodles of noodles for the rest of the month just so that I can eat. And that doesn't just happen for me, it happens for a lot of people.
I'm very uncertain about my future financially because my current job will be over in May. I don't exactly know what I'm going to do after that because that means that $400 that helps pay for my expenses will not be there if I don't find some other employment. My parents taught me as a young child that I had the right to be independent. And I had the right to get a job as a person with a disability. And I had the right to speak up for what is right for people with disabilities. And I'm so proud of that. I'm sorry for getting so emotional. I have a closing thought that I would like to leave you with, and that would be that my life is full of love and happiness. But it is also very difficult at times. Um, when lawmakers are thinking about whether to cut SSDI benefits, I would like them to picture my face and to think about my not being able to have a life outside of my apartment. As you can see, Kira is a phenomenal spokesperson, and she tells her story with Social Security in such a compelling and important way. Let's take some time to understand exactly what it is we're talking about when we say Social Security. We're talking about a program called Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance, or OAS. VI. And for the general public, they often only think of the old age person, the, the old age piece, the retirement piece. But really, Social Security is so much more than that. If you pay in and you meet the work credit requirements, if you retire, you'll receive a benefit. If you pass away, your family, your dependents, could receive a benefit. If you yourself become disabled and can no longer work, you receive a benefit. There was no other insurance product like this on the market. It is one of the most versatile, one of the most important products out there that helps lift people out of poverty. And for folks who are receiving benefits and are still living in poverty, it's a lifeline that keeps them in the community with dignity and safety. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, how it's funded. For those of you who receive wage earned income and receive a W-2, you'll notice that your um, paycheck has a FICA tax that's taken out of your paycheck. That's Social Security. That's old age survivors and disability insurance and you pay a percentage, and your employer matches that percentage, and those funds go into a trust fund, a gigantic piggy bank that is there to pay the benefits of every eligible individual in that system. Now, a quick note about DAC beneficiaries. They might move into various sort of sectors of these old age survivors and disability insurance. What I mean by that is if their parent is retired, their parent receives a full, their full retirement and the DAC beneficiary receives a percentage of their parent's retirement benefit. If their parent passes away, the DAC beneficiary receives a, a percentage of a survivor's benefit. 
same with disability insurance. So it's a very flexible program and a DAC beneficiary might find themselves in any one of these facets of that program. I think it's important to, to recognize that more than a third, more than a third of all monthly social security benefits that are sent out each month go to non-retirees. More than a third of all social security benefits that are sent out each month go to non-retirees. This is so much more than a retirement program. And the stake for intellectual and developmental disability community is rather large. Now, in the video, it said that 870,000 DAC beneficiaries relied on Social Security. That number is now 930,000 individuals. Now, one other thing that you should know about wage earned income is that only the first $109,000 that someone earns is subject to the FICA tax. Now, what does that mean? If you earn $40,000 and you've earned $40,000 for the last 10 or 15 years, that means that all of your income is subject to the FICA tax. If you earn a million dollars a year in, in wage earned income, only the first $109,000 of what you earn is subject to the to FICA tax, and the rest is tax-free. Something to think about as we discuss further issues and needs of this program. So this is a little bit of a, a taste of what we mean by Social Security. Um, let's take a moment to talk about what we're not talking about today. We're not talking about something called Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. SSI is another important program and although it's administered by the Social Security Administration, like Social Security itself, it's a different program entirely. Instead of being funded by a trust fund and paid by wage earned income taxes, it's funded through the US Treasury. And SSI is a means tested program. That means that you have to be living in poverty, you have to be either 65 or older, have a disability or be blind. This is a very important program there are many people who are eligible for both Social Security and SSI, but this is not what we're talking about today, and this is not what most people mean when they talk about Social Security. So we just want to be really clear on that. And while we're talking about what we're not talking about, we wanted to take another minute to talk about some other things that will not be emphasized today. I think many of you are familiar with that parking lot concept in a presentation where there are many issues that are important and relevant but not part of the scope of the discussion for the day. In addition to supplemental security income, we're not talking, or we're not taking questions on individual benefits. We're not spending a, a great deal of time talking about some of the persistent social security issues that we know need changing. I'm gonna give voice to some of those issues and they're very, very important. But right now we're looking at a fundamental decrease in overall benefits. And that's the focus of what we're here to talk about today. So we've talked a little bit about what we mean by Social Security. And before we talk about the ways in which it becomes a critical safety net for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we wanted to take a moment to really talk about that community and its diverse relationship with this critical um, insurance product. The disability community, we are individuals. We are individuals who are part of larger families. And although our condition is often categorized as pediatric in nature, you and I both know that the truth is we grow up. We grow up and our parents are aging. They're getting tired and they're worried about our future. In fact, it's estimated that over 850,000 adults with disabilities live with caregivers over the age of 65. This comes from Braddock's State of the State data. 
It's a conservative estimate, and I'm going to say the number again because it's so important. Over 850,000 adults with disabilities live with caregivers over the age of 65. So when we're asked to answer what seems like a really simple question, what does Social Security mean to our community? The truth is it can mean so many different things. It means one thing to an adult with a disability who's trying to live with as much dignity and independence in the community as possible. It means another thing to that individual's sibling who lives across country and wants to make sure that their sibling's supports are strong and in place and will endure. It means another thing to a young family who's currently paying into Social Security and wants to make sure that those benefits are in place for their child. And finally, the adult child who's living with their aging caregiver. Chances are they're both receiving a Social Security payment and they're still living in poverty. So we have many different stories to tell, many different relationships to this one program. And each of those stories are so important and they need to be told. Although we have different relationships to Social Security, we have one thing in common. Social Security, at its core, is a promise. If you pay in, you will be protected. If you pay in, your family will be protected. And we, the Intellectual and Developmental Disability Community, we are part of that promise. Now let's take a minute to look at some of the specific ways that Social Security is an important and critical safety net for individuals with intellectual and developmental disability. First of all, Social Security is a modest, modest income support that helps an individual remain as independent as possible in the community. Now, no one is getting rich off of Social Security. You'll remember that Kira pinches her pennies at the end of every month to make it through. And she has a very modest budget that she puts together and that she adheres to like nothing else because she has no other option. Another really important component about this modest income support is that it's a reliable in income support. You know when it's arriving, you know how much it's going to be, and you can plan on it. I think what sometimes we forget is that every penny of that benefit is spent in the community. Every penny of this modest income support is spent in the community on housing and food, incidentals, electricity. This is a benefit that also supports the community. Social Security triggers Medicare coverage for, other pe for people who may otherwise not have a health benefit. For example, if you're not income eligible for Medicaid, this is your option. If you don't have a job as much as you've been looking for one and trying to get employed, Medicare would be your option. Or let's say you have a job and your employer does not provide you with health care coverage. After a two year waiting period, Medicare is your health care option. And beneficiaries are able to earn up to $1,000 per month and still maintain their benefits. This is really important. You can earn up to $1,000 net each month and still maintain your benefits. If you would like more information and really detailed fact sheets on the importance of Social Security and the disability community and some of the ins and outs of how that works, I would highly encourage you to go to www.disabilityandsocialsecurity.org and see the materials that were created by the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. So these are all great things. This safety net shows a lot of wonderful aspects of the program that are critical for our community. But let's take a second and let's think about Kira. Some things that you didn't see on the video. 
it takes Kira two hours every day to get ready for work. And she rides the access bus, accessible transportation to and from work. It can take her between two and four hours round trip to get to her job and back, depending on where she is in the queue of that transportation service. So that's six hours a day just to get ready and to get to and from work. What a commitment she has to her employer. What a commitment she has. What does she want more than anything? She wants to work more. She wants to work every day of the week. She wants a full-time job. But what is she afraid of? Kira is afraid more than anything of earning $1,001. Because if she earns $1,001, she could lose her Social Security benefits. So there are many ways in which Social Security could better meet the needs of our community. And although we're not going to spend great time on them today, again, we wanted to give voice to some of these issues. We would really like for the Social, for Social Security to consider a sliding scale approach instead of an all or nothing approach to wage earned income. SSI has that sliding scale approach, and we think it could be applicable here. We would like to end the marriage penalty for disabled adult children who want to marry and are afraid that they'll lose their benefits if they do. We'd like to end the two-year waiting period for Medicare so that people don't go two years without the needed health care coverage that helps them live successfully and healthily in their community. We also want to reduce the adjudication time it takes to have your claim considered. Now, they've made huge strides in this area. We've gone from over 500 days to have your case adjudicated to over 300 days. And while that's a huge, significant decrease, it's still almost a year to wait to hear if you're eligible for this benefit. If you'd like more information on some of these issues and longstanding issues with Social Security, I encourage you to go to thearc.org and look at their legislative goals We've got individuals who are so dedicated to these issues. In fact, the ARC has one of the nation's best thinkers on disability and Social Security, and they're working on this every day. But that's just a piece of the puzzle. Today, we're going to be talking about why even the fundamentals, the base benefit that you receive, could be reduced and how to protect it. So we've talked a little bit about what we mean by Social Security. We've talked a little bit about our diverse relationships with this insurance product and how important it is to our community. And we've talked about some of the key aspects that make it such a useful and critical safety net for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. And now it's time to spend some time and talk about why America's most successful program could be at risk for benefit reductions. There are essentially four reasons why Social Security could be at risk. Um, the first, in my opinion, is persistent misunderstanding. How many of you have heard the phrase, Social Security is bankrupt? It's not going to be there when you retire. I, I hear this so often, and it's so frustrating because it's simply not true. Social Security right now, at the end of 2010, had a planned surplus of $2.6 trillion. Again, at the end of 2010, Social Security had a planned surplus of $2.6 trillion. And that surplus is expected to grow to $4.2 trillion by the end of 2024. So why is it that we hear that Social Security is bankrupt? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, Social Security as a program is required to project its solvency, its ability to pay all of its beneficiaries 75 years into the future and to respond to that projection. How many other government programs are required to project their solvency 75 years into the future? 
no other program, just Social Security. And in doing so, they have to plan for what they expect may occur. Well, they expect that baby boomers are going to be retiring at a high rate. They anticipate that. And they, with that anticipation, they think that the surplus that they've, that they've accrued over time will be spent by 2039. Now, that gives us quite a bit of time to increase revenue, to strengthen the program, and to assure that all the beneficiaries receive what they're entitled to. You'll remember that I mentioned that the first $109,000 of wage earned income was taxable under the FICA tax. It may be surprising for you to hear that initially, 90% of all wage earned income was subject to the FICA tax. Now, that number is only 83%. What does that mean? That means that low and middle income earners still pay 100% of their earned income, uh, still have 100% of their earned income subject to the FICA tax, where individuals of the higher income bracket and that higher end has continued to get higher and higher and higher each year. They only pay the first 109,000. So if you're a factory worker and you make $45,000, $45,000, your entire earnings are subject to FICA tax. But perhaps the head of that company that you work for, he or she might make $4 million. Only the first $109,000 that they earn is subject to federal income, the FICA tax. The rest is free and clear for them. So if we even raised the earned income, the taxable earned income, from 83% to 90%, we would make up more than a third of the projected revenue needs that we would have at 2039. What's another commonly used phrase that Social Security is adding to the deficit. Well, we know that's not true because the money that you pay in and your employer matches from your wage earned income goes into a trust fund, a piggy bank. That is the only way that benefits are paid. So Social Security didn't cause the deficit and doing what we need, need to do to strengthen and preserve Social Security is not going to fix the deficit. It's, it's a non-issue. So why are these misunderstandings so persistent? In my opinion, I think it's because Social Security is a complex system. It's difficult to understand. And while people might have a strong opinion about how much they support Social Security and want to keep it strong, they don't know the ins and outs of the program, and they're not able to refute these claims. But here's the real truth. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a Social Security expert. What you need to do is to tell your story, to tell your relationship to Social Security, the way in which it supports you in your independent life. Leave the experts to do their thing, but talk to lawmakers now about why Social Security is such a critical part of your life and that you support it remaining as strong as possible. Another issue I think that has really created some risk for Social Security is an economic downturn and a corresponding sort of contentious political environment. In an economic downturn, we know that, that older Americans who lost their job, who were not able to find employment elsewhere, result, um, resorted to retiring early. So they're receiving a benefit earlier than anticipated. And I will add at a loss to them, because if you retire before the normal retirement age, if you retire early, you're allowed to do so, but you receive a reduced benefit. We also know that applications for disability insurance 
increases in times of economic downturn. But I think it's important to recognize that Social Security, when it was created, was designed to help relieve the number of people living in poverty. It was designed to support people in an economic downturn. And using the safety net is part of why it's there. The other issue is that we're in a really po interesting political environment. We have many individuals who are new to their elected office, and they may not have a nuanced understanding of the complexities of Social Security. We need to help connect the dots for them. They also may not have a huge understanding of the disability community in general. And again, it's our job to connect those dots. In addition, there are several committees recently that have been asked to grapple with our nation's deficit issue. The first was the President's Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, also known as the Deficit Commission. And the Deficit Commission was charged with creating a balanced budget by 2015. They needed 14 votes to bring their suggestions to Congress. They didn't get 14 votes, but they still published their suggestions. And part of their suggestions included reduction in benefits to Social Security. Now, many of you have heard of the Super Committee. This is a committee of 12 members of Congress, six from the House, six from the Senate. They're an equal number of Republicans and Democrats chosen by their leadership. And they've been tasked also with grappling with deficit issues, reductions in spending. I won't go into great detail, detail about the Super Committee, but I will kind of give you a, a thumbnail sketch and that is, there's essentially a three-step process in coming up with this gigantic reduction in spending and the deficit by Thanksgiving. In the first step, Social Security is protected. In the second step of this process, Social Security is at risk and changes could be made. Now, if this committee by a simple majority cannot agree on what to do, then automatic cuts go into place. If those cuts go into place, Social Security may be safe, but the Social Security Administration who administers the program, for example, might face significant cuts. Now again, you don't have to be an expert to follow the super committee to understand what's going on and when, but it's important that you sign up with an organization that you trust that might provide you with an action alert or timely information that tells you what's happening and when and when your voice might be most useful. So pay attention to this political environment. Remember that many people are new to their position, don't have a nuanced understanding of Social Security, and may not have a single relationship within the disability community. It's our job to tell our story, to make, that, to make that connection for those elected officials, and to protect Social Security. The last, I think, factor that's putting Social Security at risk is spin. How many of you heard when a recent GOP presidential candidate called Social Security a Ponzi scheme? I was so disheartened when I heard that because it was so fundamentally untrue. I mean, a Ponzi scheme is fraudulent activity with no financial backing. Social Security has paid every benefit it's owed throughout the lifetime of this program and has a projected surplus of $4.2 trillion by 2024. Let's, let's focus on the facts. The other spin, and I think something that we need to pay particular attention to, is what is called a benefit reduction. You might hear, well, we're not reducing benefits, we're just increasing their retirement age. 
or we're not reducing benefits. We're just changing the cost of living adjustment. I'm going to take a second to talk about these program, uh, these issues and why they are, in fact, a benefit reduction. Now, currently, the normal retirement age for someone born after 1960 is 67 years old. Imagine if that was increased to age 70. That has some really interesting repercussions and negative repercussions. For example, Kira, if she was waiting for her parent to retire so that she could receive a very modest benefit, she would have to wait three more years. Three more years at the current rate of benefit that she's receiving, assuming no increases of any kind, is roughly $27,000. That's a benefit decrease. For manual workers who have very physically demanding jobs or individuals with disabilities who are in the workforce and are experiencing a gradual loss of function over time, they, not, they may not be able to make it to the quote unquote normal retirement age. And if they retire early, they're gonna receive a reduction in benefits. That's a benefit decrease. Let's look for a second at the COLA or the cost of living adjustment. One of the great things about social security is it says it needs to be evaluated, the benefit needs to be evaluated to assure that it's keeping up with inflation so that people have essentially the same buying power in whatever economic environment there is to, to take care of their needs. Now, there's a new way of calculating the cost of living adjustment, or COLA, that's getting a lot of press right now. It's called the chained CPI. Again, it's called the chained CPI, or Consumer Price Index. And on its head, it seems pretty reasonable. The premise of the change CPI says this, that in times of economic downturn, that individuals will either um, choose to consume a product or service less, find a cheaper alternative, or go without. And that seems pretty sensible. But there's two two things you should know. One, part of what may, makes the change CPI so popular is that it's consistently calculated at a lower rate than the current cost of living adjustment formula. And I've heard it explained a couple of different ways. In the Social Security, a recent Social Security congressional hearing, an individual who was testifying referred to the change CPI in this way. They said, Instead of buying a Mercedes, you just buy an Audi. I found that analogy to be pretty out of touch with most of the people I know who are relying on Social Security benefits. Wouldn't we all love an Audi? I heard it described in a different way that I thought was a little closer to home. It said that instead of buying steak, you just buy hamburger. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense on many levels. But let's remember Kira. At the end of the month, she's eating oodles and noodles, not hamburger. And what's less than oodles and noodles? No food. There's nothing less than oodles and noodles except no food. So it's incumbent upon us to talk to our lawmakers and say, hey, Steak to hamburger makes a lot of sense. And the reality is, in our community, folks aren't eating hamburger to get by. They're eating noodles and noodles. And that small change that you consider to be so minuscule in a cost of living adjustment means the difference between noodles and noodles and no food. It's so important that we tell our story. So we have some tools that can help you tell your story. If you go to www.arcnc.org, you'll be able to find these things. First, the Kira video, 
and her telling her story so eloquently and so passionately. Various fact sheets, many of which come from the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities that look at some of the very detailed and specific issues with Social Security and the disability community. Here's where you can get the facts and you can get it in great detail. You can download this Prezi with audio and show it to your friends, your neighbors, your family members, your organization. Along with the Prezi, we have just a handout of notes that can go with it, as well as an evaluation form if you want to see how well it resonated with your community. We have a toolkit that has sample letters to the editor, ways to contact your legislator, your lawmaker, and also what to do if you have two seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, or 30 minutes to participate in advocacy. We created a tool that helped other people create their own video advocacy. So in individuals like Kira, who may not have the transportation or the means to get to their lawmaker, but still want to tell their story, how can they do that? How can they make their own video advocacy um, product and share that? You can download those um, instructions and slides. You can also sign up for action alerts from the ARC. Know when it's time to use your voice. Where are we in a process where your voice would be even more critical than if you just called the, your lawmaker out of the blue today? These are things that we hope that you can use and share. You can post them on your own website. You can make them your own. And we hope that you do. Now you might say, yeah, that's great, but I've got three kids and a job and a house to run. I have zero free time and I'm exhausted. And that's fair. Times are tough right now and people are tired. Well, Here's the thing, you don't have to take on every possible policy issue. Consider taking on two issues, two issues that are important to you. And you'll know which ones to choose because these are the ones that make your heart sing or your blood boil. These are the issues that make your heart sing or your blood boil. And when you sign up for those action alerts or um, the Ark of the United States provides a wonderful product called Capital Insider that gives you a weekly snapshot of various issues. Give yourself permission. Just scan for the issues that are most important to you and follow them. You'll notice that as you age or as your child ages, those issues that make your heart sing and your blood boil, they might change. So give yourself permission to change to new issues, but before you let go of the old ones, find someone and encourage them to use their voice, to tell their story, to recognize the power of their kitchen table. Now, when you ask someone to participate, they might say, well, you know what? I'm just, I'm not a political person. Politics right now is so contentious. I just, I just don't like to get involved like that. And that's understandable. Politics right now are pretty contentious, but I think some people may forget that doing nothing is a political act. Doing nothing says, please give me more of the same, or in terms of current circumstances, please take a little bit off the top because I have so many resources, so much assistance. I don't worry about education, employment, housing, transportation, healthcare, you just go ahead and keep what you're doing because I've got everything I need. I don't know a single family with a disability that can say that. So the next time you hear someone say, I don't really want to participate, I'm just not political, let them know that not participating is in itself a political act. We've talked about many stories and many relationships to Social Security. Did we tell your story? Do you see yourself on this bulletin board? Do other people see you? This is where it's your turn to call your lawmaker, send an email, attend a town hall meeting, visit them when they're at their 
congressional local office. Because you have the power, you have the story, and you have the capacity to build a relationship that can help strengthen your life and the lives of individuals that you love and care about. I want to thank you so much for taking this time to, to meet with us, to talk about this important story, and to realize the power of your voice. We look forward to being in touch in the future. Thank you.